Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much. Well, this week I accidentally printed um, my sermon on cardstock, so hopefully that makes it a little bit more valuable. <laughs> yes, yes, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things, they'd just been printing flyers and I forgot to change the paper out. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, let's switch over to the sermon. All right. We are, uh, for those of you who haven't been with us in a, in a couple of weeks, we're still tracking through Jeremiah. We're up to chapter 16 this week. And uh, this week we're really going to talk a little bit about Jeremiah's way of life, some of the things that the Lord called him to do uh, or not to do. And then, um, uh, but we just want to, if you go to the next slide, let's just remember where we're at. We are still in that three-year period between when Pharaoh Nico installed Jeconiah, uh, or Jehoiakim, sorry, Jehoiakim. Uh, he renamed him Jehoiakim. And before Babylon has come down that fertile crescent to take the first uh, people captive. And it is possible, we're getting pretty close to the end of that period of time, it's possible that the armies were within sight of Jerusalem by this time. Uh, so. They would have been very, very close. Now, um, let's just go ahead. Uh, we'll just, you know, and just so you remember, last, last week we, let's see, we talked a bit about God speaking to the people about how even if Moses and, uh, Moses and Samuel were there, he would not listen to those intercessors. God was basically saying that there's no amount of intercession that's going to, to stop me from bringing judgment this time. But let's go ahead and go right into Jeremiah chapter 16. The word of Adonai came to me saying, You will not take a wife for yourself or have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says Adonai about sons, about the sons and the daughters born in this place, and about their mothers who gave birth to them, and about their fathers who father them in this land. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. They will be like the dung on the surface of the ground. They will be consumed by the sword and by famine. And their carcasses will be for food for the birds and the, of the sky and the beasts of the earth. For thus says Adonai, do not enter a house of mourning, neither to go to lament or bemoan them. For I have taken away my shalom from this people. It's a declaration of Adonai. As well as my mercy and my compassion. Both great and small will die in this land, and they will not be buried. Neither will anyone lament them, or cut themselves, or shave their head for them. No one will break bread for them in mourning, give comfort or, or give comfort for the dead. Nor will anyone offer a cup of consolation to drink for anyone's father or for his mother. You must not go into the house of feasting to sit with them and to go eat and to drink, for thus says Adonai Tzavaot, the God of Israel, I am about to eliminate from this house before your eyes and in your days the sound of joy and the sound of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Now it will come to pass that when this people, when you tell this, the, this people all these words, that they will say to you, why has Adonai pronounced all this great evil against us? So what is our iniquity? And so what is our sin that we have committed against Adonai our God? Then you will say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says Adonai, and you have walked, walked after other gods, served them and worshipped them, and forsaken me, and have not kept my Torah. Yes, you have done worse than your fathers. For here you are, each one of you, walking after the stubbornness of his evil heart, and not listening to me. So I will cast you out of this land into a land that you have not known, neither you nor your fathers, and there you will serve other gods day and night for I will give you no grace. Therefore the days 
a quickly coming, declares Adonai, when it will no longer be said as Adonai lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Rather, as Adonai lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had banished them. So I will bring them back into the, their land that I gave to their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says Adonai, and they will fish for them. And after that I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them down from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all of their ways, they are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. For I will repay them double for their iniquity, and their land, uh, and, their, and for their sin. Because they have profaned my land, they have filled my possession with the carcasses of their vile things and their abominations. Adonai, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of affliction, to you will the nations come, and from the ends of the earth, and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, futility, and useless things. Will man make gods for himself, yet they are not gods? So I will surely make them know, this time I will make them know my hand and my might, and they will know my name is Adonai. All right. So there's certain divine constraints that the Lord places on Jeremiah in this passage. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, he basically tells Jeremiah, don't get married, don't go to a funeral, and don't go to a feast. And also, do explain why the judgment is coming. These four different things that the Lord tells Jeremiah to do. And he's given very specific reasons for these constraints. Let's, first, let's look into the first one, don't get married or have kids. The reason for this is that all the children born at this time were about to be killed or exiled. And you've got to understand, we are one year before Nebuchadnezzar takes off the best and brightest youth of Jerusalem all the way back to Babylon. The children were guaranteed to be going into exile at this point. Jerusalem is about to experience that first wave of exile. And they would watch their children being carted away in front of them to Babylon. And then a decade later, give or take, the entire city of Jerusalem would be burned to the ground and the rest of the people of Israel would be thrown into exile. You know, this warning is actually very similar to a warning that Yeshua gives in Luke chapter 21, verse 20. Let's turn over to that. Luke Chapter 21, and I chose this gospel because the gospel in Matthew does not include all of the details. This is the beauty of eyewitness testimony. Different eyewitnesses remember different things. And uh, Matthew wrote down some parts of this conversation. This is the Olivet Discourse. This is the discussion that Yeshua had on the Mount of Olives the week before he uh, was crucified. But he says this in the Gospel of Luke. Starting at verse, uh, chapter 21, starting at verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those inside the city must get out. And those in the countryside must not enter her. For these are the days of punishment to fulfill all that has been written. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those nursing babies in those days, for there will be a great distress in the land and a wrath on this people, and they will fall by, fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be trapped.
buttons to all turn on. Hey, Jonathan, did we mute the other mic? Hello? Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, I have heard Christians quote the verses, um, you shall be the head and not the tail, every place where your foot shall tread I have given unto you. Now, that was specifically spoken to Israel. Now, to what extent can Gentiles take every single promise given to Israel? So, again, we go back to what's the context. There, are, there is very specific language around the covenant that was given at Mo, uh, to Moses on Sinai, to the children of Israel, the seed of Israel, okay? What I find is a problem, and this is a big problem, a lot of people who want to claim that blessing to be the head and not the tail also ignore all the curses. And this comes back to, if you're going to be under the Mosaic Covenant, okay, Mosaic Covenant comes with blessings and curses. The problem with the Mosaic Covenant is you cannot fulfill all the laws, so therefore you're automatically under the curse. Because you can't have sacrifice in a functioning temple with a functioning priesthood. There is, there's none of that. And so therefore, when we're looking at that language, so in that language you've got to look at, is this verse, the way that a covenantal language is written, is, is a promise between God as the king towards the people saying, I will do this if you do this. All right? If you, and he does, he's the same language to Jeremiah. All the prophets are pointing back to the covenant and saying, God, God is coming with judgment because he said he would as a part of the Mosaic covenant. He is fulfilling his word. And God keeps telling Jeremiah, I'm doing exactly, and he keeps, you know, quoting back to the Mosaic covenant. I believe that you'll find that that verse is specifically related to the Jewish people as a part of the the stipulations of blessings that come from obedience to their covenant. Okay? So when, you, when I say their covenant, there's two specific places at the end of Leviticus and at the end of Deuteronomy where there's a list of blessings and curses. Those blessings and curses are exclusively for the children of Israel as a part of the Mosaic covenant. Okay? So that is the stipulations or, you know, it comes with, you do this, and I will do this. If you don't do this, I will do this. All right? So God is saying, you keep the covenant. If you keep it, I will be your God. You will be the head, not the tail. I will be it. You know, one of you will take a thousand to flight and two of you 10,000 to flight. You'll be blessed in the cities, blessed in the fields. You'll be blessed and you'll have lots of kids and lots of sheep and lots of animals and lots of fields and lots of this. And then a chapter later, he says, and if you don't keep the covenant, then you will be the tail and not the head. You will, you will be, you will, a, a thousand of you will run from one. Ten thousand of you will run from two. You will not have kids. Your kids will die in the fields and your fields will die and you'll be, you'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the field and cursed in the, and it goes on and on and on. And the curses are three times as long as the blessings. Mm. So when we're dealing with a context, we have to look at that. This is why a new covenant was required is because the children of Israel broke the covenant. And so when we look at the covenant in Jeremiah, which we will get to, we're going to see that it comes with a different set of blessings and a different set of curses. In fact, what you notice is the absence of curses. But then, fear not, for I am with you. Absolutely. Then, okay, that was spoken to Joshua. Yes. Okay, I'm just asking, to what extent, every time mm -hmm. God says something to Israel, yep. as we that are grafted in, where do you say, yes, I can take all of those promises for my Yeah, yeah. So when I look at that, I say, okay, there's a promise. Is that promise repeated in the New Covenant writings, the writings of the apostles? Did they see it as a part of the New Covenant? All right? Is it repeated from Jesus' mouth? Because Jesus was inaugurating the New Covenant. So it's what Jesus says that are now the conditions for our, our, our covenant. They are the conditions, if you will. You know, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Is there a time when Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you? For lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. Vaguely remember it saying that in Revelation, but it's, he also says it in other places, like at the end of John. So this is where we look at the new covenant, we say, okay, 
What are the stipulations for the new covenant? Well, I shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What are all the commandments that Jesus repeated and said were a part of this? Well, Jesus took a lot of commandments and took them to a higher level. He says, it's not just about commit, don't commit adultery. Don't even look at a woman with lust in your heart. It's not enough to not kill. Don't even hate somebody in your heart. You see, he takes it to the next level. It's not enough to say, oh, just, I'm going to not eat unkosher food. No, no, no. It's not what just comes out of your mouth. It's what goes into your, oh, sorry. It's not what goes into your mouth. It's what comes out of your mouth. You know, jealousies, envies, uh, slander, and all these other things. So Jesus, he's taking that law to a new level and saying, this is what it is in the new covenant. And then we sit there and we answer the same way as the apostles do. Because the apostles, when, when they heard this stuff, Jesus, I was just reading this in Luke the other day. Jesus turns to the rich young ruler and says, you've done this all great, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor, then come follow me. And then you'll have treasure in heaven and come be my disciple. But all the disciples, they turned around and they said, how is anybody going to be saved? In other words, God, Jesus, you've set the bar so high that none can make it. And what does Jesus answer? With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And this is part of the promises of the new covenant, is that God would fill us with his spirit, would give us a new heart, would allow, write his law on our hearts to allow us to be even able to do it. So it's mercy in and mercy out. It's God's grace. And this is the grace of God. Right? So yes, uh, I would look specifically at passages. And the easiest way is to look for an exact copy of that verse in the New Covenant writings. And, um, and if you don't find it, you can just treat it there as a nice to know. And as a, I will look at other passages, you can look at that passage in context to what the author also says. Does the author apply it to the nations as well? Or is it just applied to Israel? Do other prophets apply that verse just to Israel, or do they apply it to all the nations? And in the in context of the head and the tail, that is almost solely, as far as I know, only given to Israel as a nation, not to Gentile nations. Now, that's God's doing, so that's what I would look at. Bernie, over here. Um, Yeah, I do believe Australia is going into judgment, but so is the rest of the world. Yes. But one thing I don't agree with is you say, we. We have a covenant. Mm. That's the good news. Right, okay. Understood. I, I, I said we a lot of times when in, in dealing with Australia, maybe for my own benefit, to remind myself that, yes, you're correct, that we have a covenant with the Lord, but as Australia goes, so go we. And this is something that... Um, what is it? There were um, some uh, sort of, there was some crying out in um, it's one in one of the prophets. I think it's in Isaiah, and they they're crying out saying, "God, why are you punishing us? We've been righteous. We've kept your word. We've kept kept your covenant." And it's the 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 voice of the the remnant, the righteous remnant, crying out and saying, "God, why are we suffering the same penalty as all the, everybody else?" And there is a time that when when a nation goes through judgment. The entire nation goes through judgment. Uh, it's, uh, I'll give you an, uh, an example. When, when Germany went through judgment in World War II, it, it didn't matter if you were a believer, you still went through judgment. In fact, maybe even worse because the persecution, not because it was God's judgment, but because the persecution got so much worse. For even like Jeremiah's case, you'll see uh, in the next couple of chapters, his life is threatened. Uh, Bonhoeffer, as an example, in, in World War II, his life was threatened. Why? Because you become the light in the darkness and people don't like light shining on their darkness. So in the sense that, yes, we do have a covenant, I agree, we're not subject to God's wrath, but I guarantee as God's heat turns up on Australia, who do you think the politicians are going to blame? Well, they're going to blame the dissenting voices. They're going to blame any voice that comes against their narrative. They're going to point the finger at anybody who says something other than their their ideal way to utopia and unfortunately that almost always ends up in being believers yeah they did that in germany but yep. god made sure there's a way out i mean before jesus was born they killed all the children before moses was born they killed all the children that's right and before the establishment of israel because satan knew that 
you know, with the Balfour Agreement at Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah that's right. So there is a battle going on, but I yeah. also do believe that um, God's the same today as he was yesterday. Absolutely. And he always finds a way out. Like you actually said with uh, the destruction of the Second Temple, there were Christians there that were warned and he looked after them. They listened to the warning and they got out. That's right. Yep. God created a way out. Uh, there is a, a look. David, do you, David has a question back there. <clears throat> Young David. How is God everywhere? So God is everywhere through his Holy Spirit. So God has revealed himself as being everywhere at all times, and yet at the same time he is sitting on the throne in heaven, and at the same time he sometimes shows up on earth as the Son of God. So he's able to do it all at the same time because God is his, 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 uh, he is complex in his unity. Yes, he is one God, but he's able to do that because he's greater than we are. Right? We can't do that, but he, all right? And it's just, of who, it's just part of who he is. That's, that's his nature. So that's who he is. Uh, just a, a question down to Joy. Yep. It's actually just a, a comment. Okay. Um, a nation is made up of the people in the land. Yes. And so that's yeah, what you were explaining yeah. before. Why does it apply? Because it, and um, it's more the First Nations people that understand the connection between the people and the land because a nation is made up of that. It, otherwise, it's not a nation. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So uh, this is... This is, you know, God deals, with, uh, God deals with people as families. So the word even for nations, the ethnos, ethnos ethnic groups, that's, that, that's families. God deals with families, family lines. Um, one of the, you know, talk, talking of redemption, one of the great stories of redemption is uh, the sons of Korah. So you read a lot of the, the Psalms, and they're written by the sons of Korah, some of the most beautiful songs that we even still sing today. Uh, are from the sons of Korah. Now, Korah was a rebellious man who he and his whole family literally got swallowed by the ground in the days of Moses. All right? His entire family was judged unless they chose not to stand with their father. And they had to deliberately walk away from their family, the family, and stand a separate. Because God, he, Moses warned, he says, if you're not part of them, get away. But if you are, stay with them. And God swallowed the entire family. But obviously, there were some who, some of the descendants who were not a part of that. And so God does have a remnant. We are, you know, part of that remnant. There's no doubt about it. We have a covenant with Yeshua. But we've got to remember the stipulations. Jesus promised us persecution as part of our covenant. So that's part of it. Now, that's not attack from God. That's persecution from the culture that we're in. So we should expect it. Okay, but at the same time, you're right. He's promised us not only life here, but also life eternally. That is, those are the blessings. Those are the things that we can look at. Oh, sorry. And then he slipped. Yeah, yeah, so he stepped out, when Peter stepped out in faith, yes, he focused in on the storm, and that's where he got his eyes off of the Lord, onto the storm, and he sank, and then Jesus had to pick him up. Yes, Grace? How is uh, um, Jesus made people out of dust, even though they have blood? Ah, that's a great thing, great question. Um, I think... That would be a really good question for you to ask Mr. Miss Suzanne Powers after the service. Um, there's a very long scientific answer for it, but let's just say we are 80% water and everything else in us can be easily found in the dirt. So God just, I'm going to leave the rest to Miss Suzanne and she can do, you can talk to her and ask her afterwards. All right, if you'd all stand, we're going to go ahead and close. Just bless the Lord for his provision.
Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pri hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Hamotzi lechem men haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let's just close with the blessing that God gave to Aaron to give to the people. Yeverech Adonai vayishmarecha Yahe Adonai panavalecha vechunecha Isa Adonai panav alecha v'yasem lecha. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, amen and amen. God bless you all. Feel free to join us for tea and coffee. Uh, and just remember for next week, We'll just be meeting outside. Uh, we'll just eat. We'll just plan on eating outside, and uh, doing it there. All right. God bless you all.